This is chapter 14, discussion number 2, The Weapons and the Fighting Fronts of World War I. World War I brought tremendous amounts of changes in the way that wars were fought. If you think back to a Civil War movie, or maybe you've gone to Gettysburg and seen a reenactment where people essentially load their guns through the, through the muzzle, they stand out in the open, and they fire at each other, that doesn't work in World War I, because a lot of new weapons have been invented during the time that really change the way that war can be fought. Now, the first and probably the most significant change as far as World War I is concerned was the invention of the machine gun, where infantry charges in straight lines like you've seen in the Civil War reenactments just cannot happen. And while a lot of the offensive tactics that a lot of the generals had learned through the 1800s was charge the enemy, run across open ground, machine guns just made that impossible as r- bullets would just kill everyone before they could even get close to their to their target also long range artillery uh f- fought uh, would fire much longer distances larger explosions and i mean even 10 miles away so if you've got to run 10 miles to be outside of the other team's other sides of artillery, and then you've got to run, then you've got to worry about machine guns when you start getting close, it starts to say that defensive war is pretty much all that's possible. Another weapon that was used during World War I was that of poison gas. Now, while this did not become a very popular weapon in years to follow, poison gas was thought to be the answer to a lot of the problems of you know dealing with machine guns lob poison gas to them the machine gunners get killed by the poison and then you can take it uh different types of poison gas could burn out the lungs it could kill or or maim people make them no longer able to fight however some of the problems with poison gas is that it's a gas and when the wind blows it might blow you blow it back at your own troops and so poison gas while used Uh, frequently, often depended on the weather, and sometimes just didn't work out in a positive way uh, to help it be a successful weapon. As we get into the later parts of World War I, the invention of tanks helps deal with the machine gun problem of getting troops closer to the enemy with having a mobile uh, artillery center with machine guns being able to get to the trenches. Uh, Also, the use of airplanes. While airplanes could not do very much during World War I, because they had just been invented 10, 15 years before World War I had started, and then uh, they could barely carry their pilots. Sometimes the pilots would take hand grenades or, or little explosive devices and lob them over, but primarily airplanes were used. Uh, for observation, to see what the enemy was doing, to see where the trenches were going. Sometimes the airplanes would try to shoot each other up in dogfights, but for the most part they were not used for delivery of ordnance. Now, a couple of other weapons that we run into is the Zeppelin. Uh, We talked about how airplanes can't bring bombs, but Zeppelins could. uh, Able to get higher elevation, they could drop bombs uh, on different enemies, And so they also were used. Now, again, once airplanes are able to get to higher elevations where the Zeppelins are, uh, they're slow, huge targets. They're not going to be very uh, useful in wars to come. However, one that's very significant in order um, for World War I and for the wars to follow is the use of the submarine, the -the under-the-sea boat which was used by the Germans uh, to sink Allied shipping or anything else they wanted to, such as the HMS Lusitania, which is going to bring the United States into the war. In order to deal with a submarine threat, instead of submarines seeing a ship here, ship there, and being able to take out anyone they want, ships started sailing in groups to help them deal with the sub-threat. This idea of the convoy... Uh, so that ships could coordinate, ships could help each other. If the submarine was sighted, uh, some would be able to get away, others would help deal with the threat. And so the submarine uh, becomes a, a significant idea in World War I, not only as far as a military standpoint, but also on a political standpoint, because submarines uh, didn't, could not conduct warfare in the way that it had been done before. I mean, for a while, submarines under international law, the expectation is is that they would come up out of the water, they'd radio the 
the ship and say, we are going to sink you. Get all of your civilians off the boat. Well, your submarine comes up, you've lost all of the advantages that a submarine gives you. And so after a while, the Germans said, forget this, and they, they stayed underwater, and everyone got upset, and the formalities of war start disappearing as well. Now, where were these wars fought? Because machine guns and trenches, the Western Front, which was supposed to be the really quick war, according to the von Schlieffen plan, became a stalemate after the First Battle of the Marne. If you look at the map that I have on this slide, you see the red line shows pretty much after the first six months of war, that was the battle line for the next four year, three years. Uh, you see little yellow spots of where there was a little bit of movement by either the Allies or by the Central Powers. But other than that, that is, they didn't move um, more than a few hundred yards either direction um, throughout the entire war. Uh, it, became, it essentially became a sausage grinder where just you know, the machine guns just kept on killing charges and it, it was a stalemate. Um, so that was the Western Front. Now, the Eastern Front actually had a large amount of significant movement as the Russians were able to push in all the way in through into Poland. Uh, you can see the yellow line on that map to, to show you the, the entirety of the Russian advance. However, the Russians had severe problems in that they had their biggest advantage was that they had huge numbers of men that they could throw into the military. The difficulty was is that they didn't have a lot of weapons. Uh, near the end of the Russian involvement in World War I, the Russians were literally sending men to the front saying, we can't give you a gun right now, but hang tight. Someone's going to die. When they die, grab their weapon and then you can start using it. Uh, so the Russians were pushed back into um, their territory from the German offensives uh, because, uh, you know, essentially because they were falling apart. Uh, and eventually Russia is going to quit the war. Uh, the southern front, remember this whole thing started in the south with Serbia. And so the Balkans were, uh, the Austria-Hungary, Germany with Bulgaria moved in against Serbia. They started... Um, um, taken over the whole Balkan Peninsula. The Ottoman Empire joined the Central Powers, uh, and so that meant that Russia could not get tr um, uh, supplies up through the Bosporus and the Dardanelles into the Black Sea. Um, the Allies were essentially, so Russia was almost on its own other than getting things through the Arctic Circle. Uh, and so a lot of difficulties happened here uh, as the Allies, the British, and eventually the Americans try to push up through uh, the Balkan Peninsula. Uh, also, if we go further east into Turkey, where the Ottomans are, the Armenians revolt against the Turkish Ottomans. Uh, they start fighting in the, you know, um, on the side of Russia, which is kind of an interesting because now they hate the Russians. Uh, the Arabs uh, try to uh, revolt against the, the Ottoman Turks uh, underneath the leadership of uh, British Colonel T.E. Lawrence, who is known as the Lawrence of Arabia, helped the Ottoman leadership, uh, or I'm sorry, revolt against the Ottoman leadership, and eventually they're able to take Baghdad, and they're going to set up a separate, separate country underneath British mandate, which would be called Iraq. That should probably sound familiar. So right here we're seeing that World War I is going to be the beginning of Iraq. This concludes discussion number two, Weapons and the Fighting Fronts of World War I.